how is this even possible? This was the thoughts in my mind when I was entering a dinner party three months ago. And it was this kind of fancy dinner party, you know, that has been planned for months and you were supposed to act and dress really nicely. And I was really excited. But a couple of minutes into the dinner, I realized that this dinner had uh, been coming to have a really unexpected turn. Because I was uh, placed beside of a person that had really different opinions and values than I had. And isn't, always, isn't it always like that? When you're supposed to act in a certain way, your whole body is just starting to bubble inside and you just want to do the opposite. And it, this was the case right now. It's just that I didn't want to laugh this time. I just wanted to do something else because I was angry. This person started talking about racism and uh, the refugee crisis in a really unempathical way. And I just had to bite my lip to stay calm. And you can feel the, the claw in your heart when somebody is not agreeing with you. Because it's really hard to handle. And I was thinking this sentence the whole time. How is it even possible to think like this? And has this happened to you? Have you met a person that you have disagreed that much so it hurts in your whole body? Raise your hands. Oh. <laughs> and what if I told you that I maybe, just maybe, have an answer to this question? How this can be possible? And the answer is algorithms. Yeah. And the world is changing. We have technology all around us today. And sometimes we spend more time with uh, fellows like these ones, or our phones, or computers, than we actually do with our closest friends and family. And maybe it isn't that stupid after all. Because although they know quite much about us, they know more about our bodies, our interests, and sometimes even our music taste. And me, yes, quite a lazy person sometimes. I think it's quite epic when you think about it, what you can do with data and algorithms today. But what happened and what happens when, when everything that you see through your screen and through your computer and phone is too customized for you? And everything that isn't interesting for you any longer is there. And the world is locked out which isn't there and that relevant for you. It's a phenomenon called filter bubbles. And it's a phenomenon that is based on algorithms. Algorithms that is based on what you have done before and uh, what you haven't done. And also where you are and uh, what, what you're doing on the internet, basically. And this is prioritizing what is relevant for, you, relevant for you and what's not. But since I had really bad mathem mathematic teachers as a kid, I know that once you're starting talking about algorithms, people have a tendency to zoom out. So I've prepared something else for you today to make this quite much easier. Have you heard about the saying that once you're about to have a kid or a baby, you start seeing trolleys everywhere around you? They just, just start to pop up. And even though they have maybe been there the whole time, you just start to seeing them. And what happens with this is almost the same thing that is happening with algorithms. Is that you, they, they detect what is relevant and what you pay attention to. But they also detect something else. The things that you don't pay attention to. And they take those kind of things away. And what is scary with that is that they also start to push s the things that you're interested in even more to you. And even though this sounds quite innocent when it happens to, to th that I'm talking about baby bubbles and, and small little cute babies and, and a couple that maybe is in love, 
this is very scary when it comes to people that maybe have very radical opinions about some things and get the same opinions pushed to them and locks out all the other opinions. Mark Zuckerberg got asked a question from a reporter some years ago. And they, they asked him about why the algorithms in his newsfeed is so important. And his answer was, a squirrel dying in your front yard, in your in your front house, in front of your house, may be more relevant to your interest right now than people dying in Africa. And even though this sounds quite harsh when you think about it, I think that I'm not alone having cat clips both in my news feed in, and in my Facebook feed. And this is just a proof of that this is something that is happening. And a guy called Eli Pariser did a test in this. He has done loads of research in the field of filter bubbles. And he did a test with two different friends of his, with two different profiles. And it was about the case with the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. It was an oil leak with the, with the company BP. And he asked his friends to Google BP at the very same second. And these filter bubbles is not only happening to our social media feeds, that is putting away and prioritizing things that you're, you're interested in. This is also happening, happening in your search engine. So the first friend of his was seeing things like, was seeing things like <laughs> information about uh, this this happening, but the second friend got uh, got information about whether he should invest in BP or not. And the same thing happened with uh, with when he did this test with uh, their friends that would, were supposed to Google Egypt, and they saw first a result of uh, having information about the crisis. And the second one had information about whether they should go on a vacation or not. And this is quite scary and quite heavy information to take in. But the most scary part about filter bubbles is that they are invincible. And we're looking in our phones quite much today. And it's quite hard to compare this to your friends as well, since mostly you hang out with people with the same values and kind of the same um, profiles as you have. Maybe you have gotten to the point that you're thinking, why the heck does a young woman stand in front of me talking about algorithms? Because I'm not a professor and I'm not an expert in this field, even though I'm quite nerdy. But I know for one fact, how it is to grow up, grow up in a digital incubator. And I want to do a throwback to the year 2003. I'm nine years old and I'm in Norway. I'm half Norwegian, by the way. And this is a very important summer for me because this is the first summer that I get to steal my Game Boy, for, uh, th this Game Boy from my older brother. And I have only been playing with DOS before, so this was like a whole new world opening for me. And I got stuck. And this is me playing the, the last level, and I, I'm about to win over my 10-year-older brother in Super uh, Mario Bros. So this is an important day. And ever since I was nine years old, I've been stuck with technology, and I, I've been amazed of, uh, of all the things that you can do with it. And when I was in the last year of high school, one amazing nonprofit organization that is working with creativity and, and entrepreneurship in schools came, came out to, to my school to talk about how you can implement and create things in schools during your time and not only do tests and read books, and you can actually try to create things and apply all your learnings in a practical way. So I tried that thing out during my time and I, I fell in love and I created my first app with some of my friends. And I eventually started working for this organization. And it's, it's quite a weird experience to be 19 years old. This is 10 years, old, uh, 10 years after my first time when I was looking at this Game Boy. To go out to a school and act cool, 
because if you couldn't tell about uh, of my haircut in the first picture, I was quite geeky. So it was a new experience to act cool, but it was so many new things that was happening to me that was more important than acting cool uh, during this time. Because I got to meet teachers and pupils and amazing people that has the most amazing passion. People that is working in schools and try to really make a difference. And that also made me connect the dots between the whole digital, um, digital experience that I had since my childhood to education and what you can do with that combined. Because it is a new generation that we live in. And if I want to have something, uh, ha have something proved and if I'm discussing something with somebody, I often take up my phone to Google it. I don't run after a book even though I read books sometimes. But what is happening right now is that the whole, the whole shift is here. We need to think in a completely different way when it comes to source criticism. Because today, if you try to find different perspectives, it's really hard to find since everything around you is customized. And in an era when people like me, millennials, I'm 22 years old right now, we spend up to 18 hours in our screens consuming different kinds of media. And we also have social media as our biggest source of information when it comes to news. And what if all these algorithms is just pushing things that we're already interested in, in these different channels? We need to be aware. And I think the easiest way to talk about this subject is to just show a palette of colors. And imagine that these different colors is different opinions and different perspectives and different ideas, which is what is making the whole society so beautiful. And that's why we have TED Talks, right? Because we want to share ideas. But what is happening with all these algorithms and these customized feeds is that this color palette is really hard to, 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 it's really hard to see the, the whole picture and see the whole palette because the other colors is getting down in prioritization, uh, priori prioritization and you only see the colors that is interesting for you. So this is something that we do need to talk about in schools because this is not only about something that is about a digital segregation because the line between digital and reality is, is very blurry today and we need to be aware. And we had an amazing TED talk uh, two years ago from a guy that is here today called Navid Modiri that, that really moved me. And he said a really good thing in the end that was about debates and conversations. And that, that is often what is happening when it comes to politics and when we talk about different kinds of opinions. That is often that we just talk about arguments and things that we're convinced that we're right about. But we st stop to listen and we stop to understand. And it's really easy to prove yourself right these days, since everything that you see is proving yourself right when it comes to your search engines or your social media. And that's why conversations is so, so important. And especially during this week with all of you, people with sharp minds and great voices. It's up to us to start a conversation and look up from our phones and start to be curious. Because even though you meet people like the guy that I met during this dinner party, that you maybe disagree with a lot. It's so important to put ourselves up from this and leave our filters behind. Because it's that, that is the first step of leading ourselves through, through this era and not let the algorithms Move, uh, move us forward. And that is something that I want you to bring with you from today. And uh, this was my TED talk. Thank you.